It is time for our next speaker, Lachlan. Yeah. Ode. Yeah. Amazing. Very excited. Uh, I think you wrote maybe a gist on what you're about to be presenting. Yeah. Which was a very, very thorough uh, argument for typed errors, which, uh, yes, definitely the most convincing argument I've heard. And I believe that's the subject of your talk right now. Wow. Well, let us behold it. Already connected. Amazing. Thanks, Lachlan. Thank you. Um, yes, I'll be talking about uh, using static types for error handling. Um, so my sort of starting point for this was that uh, I think that every argument I've heard for static typing applies to, for, to error handling as well. Uh, uh, but in Scala, it, doesn't, it hasn't been that common. Um, it seems only Zio is really uh, doing static typing for, for errors, and so I wanted to make the case for it. Um, uh, and this also sort of works in reverse. Like if you, if you listen to some of the arguments you hear against uh, using static types for errors, if you look at those arguments, they, they kind of boil down to arguments against static typing in general. So I think if you if you like static typing, you should really like uh, statically typed errors as well, um, because errors they're just, in functional programming at least they they're just uh, they're just values that describe the state of the program. And so you can have values that you can manipulate using our normal FP tools. They're not really that, that different. They're just, uh, you, um, when you have an error, you want a short circuit, you don't want to continue what you're doing, but that's, that's really the, the main difference between an error and a success. Um, and so, yeah, errors c can have types, and I don't know if you know this, but static types are great. Like, uh, you make a mistake, the compiler just is going to pinpoint exactly where your mistake is. Amazing. Um, so I think I'm probably blowing your mind with this right now. Um, but so this this comes up with, with errors as well. The same thing can happen. Um, for whatever reason, your your code ends up throwing a different, well, uh, producing a different kind of error. And this this code here is sort of representative of the mainstream sort of standard way of handling, handling errors in Scala. Um, and the compiler can't really do anything to help you identify mistakes like this. Your, your error handling now is, is useless. It's not going to do, do what you expected. Um, and this and this seems strange that this is like the sort of the mainstream standard thing we do because we're using Scala. It's a language I think it's fair to say is a very powerful and sophisticated type system. But when it comes to error handling, um, the sort of consensus is we don't need it. We don't, we don't have to use the type system. It seems strange. And maybe if we look at sort of the mechanisms available to do, if we want to do static type errors, Maybe Martin Odersky agrees this is a problem because we now have a, we now have a new way, uh, potentially, available, which is uh, the safer exceptions, which is a, like an experimental feature uh, under development that you can turn on in Scala 3.1. And, and the book sort of, you can think of it, safer exceptions, as they're like Java checked exceptions, except it fixes some of the major downsides of of what you get in Java, and one of those major downsides is in Java, if you want to use a, like a higher order function with any sort of checked exception, it's a, it's a real problem. Uh, but with safer exceptions, it has a like, quite, to me, looks like a very elegant solution to that. Um, so that looks nice, but the problem with this is to actually use these safer exceptions, you have to throw them. And throwing exceptions is not referentially transparent, and so we lose all our nice features that we are, we are so used to now from having referential transparency. So from a functional programming point of view, unfortunately, it's not that interesting. Uh, but I think if this uh, feature gets the wider Scala community to, to think more about using types for error handling, that would be, uh, that would be amazing. 
Um, so if we want to stick to our FP world, um, can't we just change our effect type? So instead of just returning successes, it returns either successes or errors. And so we can, and that does give us um, statically typed errors, but as we sort of saw earlier on, when you try to do this, the boilerplate just becomes insane like very quickly. Um, and so it's not really of any practical use. But of course, we do have these wonderful things called monotransformers, transformers, which were designed to solve exactly this problem. And so we can just take this E to T, E to T you know, exists in Scala, and apply it to our um, effect type. And this basically takes that boilerplate, encapsulates it, and takes care of applying it for you. You don't have to worry about it anymore. And this works. But it doesn't work in Scala as nicely as it does in Haskell. There's some downsides, um, which we'll get to. Uh, and then we have what Zio does, which I'm sort of calling the covariant bifunctor. It's just well, something to call it. Um, and so I think this really hits uh, the sweet spot, it, um, at least in Scala. It, it, it just it covers all the common cases in a really nice way. And so a bifunctor is just like a functor, except that instead of like a type you can map to some other type, the, it has like two cases, with, and each with a different type. And so we make one case the, the, the error type, and the other case the success type. And so um, either is a bifunctor, and so is Zio's IO type. Um, and so the good things about using uh, this for, for errors is, again, no boilerplate, um, even, even less boilerplate than either T. Um, and the type inference works very well. Uh, so with either T, the, the, you know, well, any minor transformer in Scala, really, uh, you have to put, you know, extra type annotations all over the place. Often you have to resort to partially applying the types, and that means you have to use um, uh, type lambdas, and so that's, that's all less than ideal. Whereas with this, it's all very sort of simple and obvious. Um, and also, it works completely seamlessly with subtyping. So, uh, and that's due to the fact it's covariant. So that's, that, that's the covariant gives you a couple of advantages, and that's one of them. Uh, if you have you know, different effects with different uh, error subtypes of some, some base error that you're using and you combine them, it just infers to the right type as you would expect. Whereas with uh, either T, because uh, either T, all the type parameters are completely invariant and so that doesn't work and you've got to end up having to put all these uh, calls to widen and left widen to make it work. And also, okay, the final point, um, the, st the stack you're working with is like fully con concrete and fixed, which you could um, could appear as a like a negative because uh, like minor transformers, it looks so flexible, right? You can just stack things together as you like, whatever you need. But in in practice, that flexibility you don't really often need it, and it comes with some real downsides. Um, uh, and you'd actually could be surprised, like just with the IO type from Zio, and the fact you can put whatever you like into that error channel uh, actually gives you a lot of flexibility in the kind of problems you, that you can solve. And a good example of that is um, some, of the, some of the methods that Zio gives you for, like if you want to introduce optionality as well, uh, that can be encoded into the error type. And it's, it's kind of like you mixed in option T into your minor transformer stack, but, but much easier. Because, um, yeah, when you, when you look at the problems of monotransformers, transformers, if you start adding more, the problems just get worse. Uh, the, the types get even more complicated and the performance you know, gets worse as well. Um, so if we're going to use typed errors, you've got a large complicated application, you... Um, do have to sort of deal with the fact that you're going to have all these, these new types to worry about. Um, 
And so we need some, some tools and some approaches to try to keep things manageable. Uh, and one, there's a few things you can do. Uh, so one good thing to do is take your low level implementation sort of errors and map them to higher level sort of domain errors that, that are more meaningful for the domain you're working in. And if you're gonna like, do something like make an abstract sort of service with multiple implementations, you'll actually find that you really have to do that. The, having the typed errors there actually forces you to include your errors in the abstraction. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's a good thing, because um, you don't want uh, like implementation details like specific implementation errors to, to leak out of your abstraction. Um, also, another problem that does come up is that sometimes you might have two effects and you want to combine them, compose them together to make some larger effect. But if the two effects have like unrelated error types, different error types that aren't really related, then the error type of the composed thing can have a very, a very sort of broad error type, like it could be exception or even potentially any. And so the problem with that is that um, you are, you are losing precision. You had precision on these specific errors uh, 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 that we have to worry about, and we've lost that precision. So in Scala 2, the only sort of good way I've found to deal with that is you, again, have to sort of make your own uh, domain errors and, and map those into them. And then you can sort of maintain the precision that you wanted. But um, in Scala 3, we have a new tool to, that helps with this, which is um, union types. And so in the case where you just want to keep that precise errors from the from the things you're composing together, but you don't really want to go to the trouble of making you know, some custom domain error. Uh, you can use unit types, uh, union types and just say, uh, this composed thing can fail with you know, error one or error two or error three. And that's really cool that we have that now. Um, and the final sort of general technique is what we saw um, a bit in the, in the workshop. Uh, in many contexts, you uh, have uh, error types getting that you have to deal with, but you know that in this context that this you can't recover from this error. There's no, there's nothing you can do about it, and so Zia makes it very easy just to turn those into the into unrecoverable defects, and and that, that, and that gets it out of the type system, uh, and sort of means that your recovery code doesn't have to worry about it and just simplifies your life. Um, so that's nice. Um, and I just wanted to briefly mention the ecosystem and the norms of the ecosystem, I think, matter a lot for something like this. And the fact that we have like this zero ecosystem that's big and it's getting bigger and, and statically typed errors are like standard practice across that ecosystem. That's, that's, that's amazing. Um, I think, uh, and that really just gives you more value out of, out of this uh, approach. Um, so, yeah, thank you, that's all I have.